This evening uh, we're going to, as I've already mentioned, look at just a few more things that the Lord particularly um, favors or treasures uh, in His people. Uh, and we're going to look at it from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 66, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4, but particularly what he says in verse 2. Let's go ahead and begin by reading that short section. Isaiah writes, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my word. But he who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol, as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations. So I will choose their punishments and will bring on them what they dread because I called and no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen, and they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing and give us ears to hear what he is saying to us this evening. Now we've been asking the question, what is it that pleases the Lord? What is it that he favors? How is it that you and I can gain his blessing beyond what it is he has already given to us, of course, in the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember, as we saw last time and the times before, there are distinctions between the Lord's servants. And there are reasons why there are those distinctions. Because his servants have particular things about them that please the Lord. Now, if you were to ask the Jews of Isaiah's day, or even during the days of Christ as far as how they might gain the Lord's blessing, they would say through the temple, among other things. The Jews gloried in the temple. They believed the Lord would bless them simply because they had it, because it was a part, of, there was, it was their possession. The Lord had chosen them from all the peoples of the earth, and he appointed one of their kings to build his house. Now, they looked at that as a very special privilege, and certainly... It was a great privilege. But as you know, they valued it, that is the temple, too much. And they missed the whole point behind it. It was actually not meant to be a, an end in itself, but rather a means to an end. It was pointing to something greater, something better. It was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ and the temple that he would build. Uh, not a temple made with hands, but one made without hands. And so to humble his people, God sent his prophets, and especially the Lord Jesus Christ, to prophesy of the destruction of this temple. God was going to withdraw from it, and he was going to allow the Babylonians, at least in the time of Isaiah, to destroy it. Now, God was going to allow it to be rebuilt one more time in the return of the Jews from exile from Babylon, but the Romans would finally put an end to it, as our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied in the, uh, the Olivet Discourse, once and for all. Now, to prepare the Jews for this destruction, God often told them how he did not need the temple. Again, we've just read in Isaiah verses one, uh, 66 verses 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is the place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. Uh, the Lord says heaven was his throne. It was the throne of his glory, the throne of his government. He sat there infinitely exalted above all blessing and above all praise. Earth was his footstool. 
where he basically stood in absolute control, overruling the affairs of man according to his will. Now, if the Lord had such, so high a throne and so great a footstool, why would he possibly need a house? And how could anyone build one that was big enough for him? God says he's the one who made everything, heaven and earth and everything that is in them, that God was perfectly happy from all eternity before he made all of these things. These things are all upheld by his power. If he needed a house, uh, he, he would have made one uh, when he made the world. And if he had made such a house, of course, it would continue to this day. But the Lord didn't make one. A temple has never been built, nor could one be built that could hold him. Heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool. He is so great that even these can't contain him, much less a temple made by human hands. So the Jews look to the temple, but God says, well, the temple is really uh, not essential. And he was planning on doing away with it. Now, the Jews not only looked to the temple, but they also looked to the sacrifices that were in that temple. The Lord certainly regarded these because they were pictures of the coming death of his son that would remove sin once and for all, that would satisfy God's justice so that he might show mercy and grace to whomever he wills. But realize that he didn't need these either. He didn't need the sacrifices because they really didn't atone for sin. They didn't really satisfy his justice. They only pointed to that which actually did, to the blood of his son, which could and did satisfy it once and for all. Now, the Lord points out that when these sacrifices, which really weren't needed, were offered with the right kind of heart in faith, believing that he would send the Messiah as he promised finally to take away sins, God would forgive them. They weren't forgiven by those sacrifices. They were forgiven by Jesus Christ to whom those sacrifices pointed. But when they sacrificed with a wrong heart, all they did was offend him. They thought just by doing the sacrifices it was going to please God, but God was looking for faith. He was looking for the right kind of heart not for this kind of sacrifice. He says through Isaiah in verses 3 and 4, He who kills an ox is like one who slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering is like one who offers swine's blood. He who burns incense is like the one who blesses an idol. As they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their punishments and will bring on them what they dread because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen, and they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. See, if you choose what the Lord delights, it pleases him. But if you choose what he doesn't delight in, it's an abomination to him. Solomon writes in uh, the book of Proverbs, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. You know, the Jews place so much trust in these sacrifices that they continue to offer them even after the final sacrifice. The final offering was made. And they continue to look to those sacrifices to perfect them and to make them acceptable to, to God even after Jesus Christ died on the cross. This, too, was offensive to the Lord because it tread underfoot the precious blood of his Son. Now, God says in our text that he doesn't favor those who look to the temple nor those who offered sacrifices with a wrong heart. But it does tell us what it is he did favor. It does tell us whom it is that he did regard and it was those with a right heart. He says again in verse 2, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Basically, the Lord was telling us it was his intention to tear down the temple and to build a new house, one that was made without hands one that would be cleansed with better sacrifices, the, the blood of his son. 
a house in which he would dwell forever, a temple that was made up of those who were humble, those who were contrite of spirit, and those who trembled at his word. Now, these are the things that God favors. This is the kind of heart that he lives in, and this is the kind of person that he will bless. So what I'd like to do is just consider each of these for just a few moments, the idea of humility, contriteness of soul, of soul or spirit, and uh, the fear of the Lord. First of all, the Lord tells us he favors those who are humble. Now, we did look at this already, so I don't want to spend a great deal of time on it, but I think it would be wise for us to review it because it's likely already escaped our thinking, and we need to hold on to it until we have actually applied it to our lives and become this kind of person. Remember that humility is just the opposite of pride. Remember Nehemiah Rogers said this, humility is the repentance of pride. And Bernard of Clairvaux called it self-annihilation. One who is proud is self-confident, self-important, forceful, oftentimes abrasive, and certainly ostentatious or showy. But one who is humble is meek and lowly, gentle, mild, and restrained. Now, using those as definitions, just look at the church, look at the people who are in this world, and decide who is proud, who is humble. Now, which of these two characteristics do you suppose describe what your Lord wants you to be? And what do you think, which of these do you think describes your Lord? Again, remember, uh, we have been predestined to become conformed to his image. We are to be growing into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at the, at the life of our Lord Jesus, he didn't go about proclaiming himself. He didn't force himself on others. He didn't seek great things for himself. He very meekly served his Father and us that he might lift us up. Uh, we read, uh, as Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not seek glory the way the world seeks glory. He sought it in the way that you seek it in the kingdom of heaven. He became for us an example. This is the way to exaltation. And because our Lord Jesus was willing to humble himself in this way, his Father exalted him to the place of greatest honor in his kingdom. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Needless to say, the Lord favors humility in his people. Certainly he favored it in his son. His son did precisely what he wanted him to do. And the Lord promises that he will exalt you to the place of highest honor in his kingdom if you are willing to humble yourself like our Lord Jesus to become the servant of all. That's what he delights in. Remember after James and John made their bid, for the seats of greatest honor in the kingdom through their mother, making the others upset uh, with them. Uh, we read in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. 
But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What does the Lord place a premium on? Pride and arrogance? Does he like the ostentatious one, the one who's showy, the one who wants everybody else to see them and to acknowledge them? No. James tells us in James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so he says in verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So Isaiah basically is relating to us, actually the Lord is telling us, that he looks over the heavens and the earth. He looks at the temple that his people built for him. He looks at the sacrifices they offered. But what really impressed him the most was not these things, but the one who is poor in spirit, self-abasing and self-denying. He says in verse 2, to this one I will look, to him who is humble. So first of all, God favors humility. Secondly, he says, he favors those who are contrite in spirit. Now the word here in the original literally means to be stricken or smitten in soul, uh, to be grieved, to be injured by what it is you have done. <clears throat> and what is it that we have done that should cause us to respond in this way? It's sin. To be contrite means to be broken hearted over your sin to be sorry that you have offended God, not just because you've been caught in the act and now you have to pay the price, but because you have dishonored him, uh, the one whom you love, the one whom you want to honor more than anyone else. When you sin and are deeply grieved by the fact that you have, by your failure, by the fact that you have dishonored him, that is what honors God. Now, it doesn't matter how great or how small, but especially in the great things. Now, when King David sinned by lying with another man's wife and then trying to cover over his sin by having her husband executed, and that's exactly what he did, when he came to his senses, he was struck in his soul when he finally saw what it is that he had done when, as it were, the heat of passion had passed. But he also knew that having experienced this grief in his soul over what he had done against God, he knew that God would not reject him because this is something that God approves of and can only be there really by his grace. He writes in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I want you to notice that David understood it wasn't enough to go into God's temple and to offer to him a sacrifice, to go through the motions of obedience. He knew that what God was looking for was the right kind of heart. His heart needed to be right with God. Now, if you're not humbled by your sin, if it doesn't grieve you when you dishonor him by failing to live up to his word, God will not accept you. But if you are grieved, if you are humbled by his grace, he says that he will. Again, verse 2, to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit. Our sins should, of course, you know, grieve us and they should humble us. Now finally, God says he favors those who tremble at his word. He is pleased with those who fear him, who take his word seriously, who's, when, when his word registers in our minds and in our hearts and we are careful to live according to his will. Now Solomon speaks very highly of this kind of fear, as you know very well from the book of Proverbs. He says, it's where instruction in godliness begins. This is how we 
begin to learn what it is that is pleasing to the Lord. He says in Proverbs 1 verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. He says that the fear of the Lord gives us the motivation that we need to turn away from our sins. Chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. In turning us from our sins, of course, it also turns us to God and if we turn from our sins and we turn to the Lord, He will protect us, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Ultimately, if we fear the Lord and turn away from evil, if we turn to His Son, we trust His Son and follow Him, it will also protect us in the life to come because we will no longer be in danger of hell but can look forward to heaven. Uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs 14, verses 26 to 27, In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. And in chapter 19, verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. Now it's because of what the fear of the Lord is able to give us that Solomon says it is also more valuable than anything else that he can imagine, certainly anything else that the world may have to offer, even more than the things that the Lord had given to him. As you know, Solomon was a very rich man. Which is more important, riches or the fear of the Lord? He says this in Proverbs 15, verse 6, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. And then in verse 20, or excuse me, chapter 23, verse 17, do not let your heart envy sinners, but live in the fear of the Lord always. Now sometimes it's difficult to explain and to understand exactly what is meant by the fear of the Lord because aren't we supposed to love the Lord? Well, of course we are. Aren't we supposed to know that the Lord loves us? Certainly then how can we be afraid of him if we know that he loves us and we love him? It seems, again, like the two are mutually exclusive. Well, I think it's here that we see what we call the creator-creature distinction. We need to remember who he is. We need to remember who we are. Yes, the Lord loves you if you are his child. Yes, you love him because he is your father, but you do need to remember he is God and you are a man. There's an infinite distance between the two of us, between the creator and the creature, and this should evoke a measure of respect. Now, that is one thing that is meant by the fear of the Lord. We respect him. We don't just treat his word as something trite because of who it is that actually said this. The God of the universe, the one who has our lives in his hands and our eternal destination. God is also infinitely holy. He loves what is good. The things that he tells us are good with an infinite love. And he hates evil to the same measure. Now this should also evoke within us a holy fear of thinking of desiring, of saying, or doing anything that would displease Him. Let's not forget what we saw last time, that God favors those who please Him, who don't just please themselves, who don't just do what they want to do, but take Him seriously at His word and seek to please Him in all things. The holiness of the Lord should evoke a fear within us and give us the motivation that we need to please Him in everything we do. Scripture says, or God tells us, that He favors those who respect His majesty, who respect His purity, who are afraid of His justice and His wrath, who stand in awe and reverence at His word, and who basically do this continually.
We're told in Scripture that uh, Felix, when he heard Paul preach about the life to come and judgment, he was afraid. But that fear lasted only as long as the sermon. Luke writes in Acts 24, verses 24 and 25, but some days, some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and judgment, the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. You see, sometimes the fear of the Lord lasts only as long as the sermon. And then basically people go and they do what they were doing before. It, it sort of holds the branch back as you're passing by, but once you let go of it, it springs back into the position it was in before. God favors those who fear him always. Solomon writes in Proverbs 16:6, By the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. That is what is pleasing to God. And so do you want to be the kind of person in whom the Lord is pleased to dwell? Do you want him to be with you? Do you want him to walk with you? Do you want him to bless you? Do you want him to prosper you in the things that you do for him? If that's what you want, then this is the kind of person that you need to be. You need to cultivate these characteristics. The Lord says in verse 2 again, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. The Lord isn't going to take seriously anyone who is proud, anyone who doesn't care whether they offend him or not, and he is not going to take seriously anyone who isn't afraid of him. The Lord wants us to take him seriously. He is God. And we are creatures. He is holy. And in and of ourselves, we are unholy. We should always be in awe and reverence of him. That is what pleases him. That is the kind of person to whom the Lord will show favor. Well, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord that he might grant that we would be that kind of person.